Good afternoon and welcome to my digital town hall on immigration reform. I want to thank all of you who have submitted questions over the last few weeks through Twitter and Facebook, email and text messages. And I also want to thank Voto Latino for their support in putting this event together. And a special thank you to Maria Teresa Kumar uh, for moderating this discussion. Uh, not only am I looking forward to answering as many questions as possible over the next half hour, but I'm excited about utilizing social media and new technology in order to further engage with Latinos and others to ensure that issues affecting our community are heard in Washington, D.C. Now, as you know, I am part of a core group of senators from both sides of the aisle who put forth a piece of legislation to advance our shared goal of comprehensive immigration reform. Two weeks ago, our Gang of Eight proposal received broad bipartisan support from the Judiciary Committee and will be on the Senate floor for debate uh, in the coming days. Uh, I believe the time has finally come for comprehensive, common sense immigration reform. We are entering a critical time in our efforts, and I know a lot of you are anxiously following this proposal every step of the way. This will be the longest overhaul of our broken immigration system in over two decades. So we have a lot to talk about, and let's get started. Thank you, Senator Menendez. We're carving out the time today to speak about immigration reform and how we can also be helpful with our audience. I couldn't be more excited to have this discussion given this critical time in the debate. And as the Senator shared, I'm Maria Teresa Kumar, President and CEO of Voto Latino. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization united in the belief that Latino issues are American issues and American issues are Latino issues. We're dedicated to bringing in new and diverse voices into the political process, such as the very people we received questions from for this town hall, and which Senator Menendez will be answering today. Senator, on behalf of the Voto Latino family, our Chairwoman Rosario Dawson, our staff and our supporters, I can't thank you enough for carving out time to be here with us today. You've done a great work with your fellow senators from both sides of the aisle, and we're on the cusp of finally passing common sense immigration reform. Yesterday, the president rightly pointed out that the immigration proposal that you and your colleagues have crafted is bipartisan. It has been debated inclusively and at length. We want to use this town hall as an opportunity to open discussion, temperature check exactly where we are in the debate, dispel the myths out there, because there are many, mm -hmm. and more importantly, inform our audience of what they can do to help solve our broken system together, now that the bill has reached the floor for debate. If passed, this bill will address a broken system. It will help boost the American economy by ensuring everyone is paying fairly into the system and leveling wages, address our national security vulnerabilities by bringing people out of those shadows so we know who's living within our borders, and ensuring that, more importantly, that America continues on her tradition of welcoming the best and the brightest from around the world. Now, a little bit about our town hall. In order to keep with the spirit of Twitter, we have shortened those questions that were over 140 characters and since we, have, we wanted to get as many different questions as possible in the next half hour, we tried to choose questions that represented the range of topics, about folks, that, uh, the range of topics that folks wrote in about. Senator, your first question will come from, let's see, drum roll. The first question comes from Hector Munoz. He asks, the bill has been debated for a couple of days on the Senate floor. Where do things stand and what is the latest update? Great. Well, before I uh, answer, Hector, let mm -hmm. me just say I turned over my Twitter feed uh, to Ali, uh, my uh, social media director, so she can, as she hears my answers, uh, tweet at the same time. So, so you're not uh, doing it right yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not doing it right now, so uh, I, I, I want people to know that. Mm -hmm. Well, Hector, uh, here's, here's where we're at. Uh, we had a procedural motion uh, yesterday that was incredibly important, which is a motion to proceed. It means let's get to the debate. Uh, and, in fact, uh, that passed in a very strong way. Now, that doesn't mean that the 80-some-odd votes that were cast in favor of proceeding to the debate means that that's what we're going to get. I hope we do, but that's not necessarily what it means. So now we're in the midst of debating, uh, you know, the legislation as a whole. Senators have come to the floor on both sides to talk about the legislation. Um, and just before our week started this town hall feed, uh, you know, Senator McCain, for example, was making his remarks on the overarching uh, essence of the bill. Then we get to amendments, uh, hopefully starting today. Uh, some of those amendments are good. Some of those amendments are not so good. And that will be the challenge over the next several days. 
And Voto Latino has developed a graphic that actually allows you to follow where the position is on the where the bill is on both on the House and the Senate. It's in a very easy, shareable, digestible graphic. So I encourage you to check it out to so, so we know exactly what steps need to be taken by our audience as well. Great. The next question follows up on that. Carmen wants to know what is the probability that we will pass a comprehensive immigration reform bill? What is your confidence level, level Senator, that the bill you are proposing will pass? Well, thank you, Carmen, uh, for that uh, question. Look, I'm, I'm, uh, I am as optimistic I ha as I have been in nearly 20 years of uh, being an advocate for comprehensive immigration reform, starting in my days in the House of Representatives and, of course, over the last uh, seven or so years here in the Senate. Uh, so uh, I look at uh, the broad support that we have achieved with this bill. I mean, we have from the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce to the AFL-CIO, from big agro uh, growers to the farm workers, from every progressive pro-immigrant rights group to uh, Grover Norquist uh, and his association. So uh, the bottom line is this is a very broad support. Uh, and it is that broad support that I think uh, when we look at from business to labor to high tech to pro-immigrant right groups to uh, religious uh, entities, we have a wide range of, uh, you know, religious organizations uh, and faiths that have joined uh, in this effort. And, and that gives me the belief uh, that uh, the Senate uh, will hear uh, what the American people are saying in poll to poll, that they want to see this broken system fixed. And I, th and I think that the, it's the resounding amount of Americans coming together across distance, uh, industries is really powerful. And I, I, I can't remember the last time I've seen that on any legislation, yeah. Senator. It was good to have all of those groups behind us when we announced uh, the legislation and who are still, mm -hmm. after the Judiciary Committee, still saying that they support the legislation. It's a priority. Yeah. No, absolutely. It's amazing. We re question number three, we received a lot of questions regarding deal-breaking amendments. Tatiana asks, we keep seeing amendments being proposed that seem anti-immigrant. What do you plan on drawing? The, where do you plan on drawing the line? Well, Tatiana, uh, this is a good question. And let me start off by saying uh, in the Judiciary Committee, uh, there were 136 amendments that were adopted. Many of them were Republican amendments, so many of them were bipartisan amendments, meaning Democrats and Republicans joined together. And they largely improved the bill. And that's fine. And we look forward to the same constructive process uh, on the Senate floor. However, there are uh, members of the Senate uh, who will be offering amendments, for example, uh, making it impossible for the pathway to citizenship to be realized, or further diminishing the opportunity for family reunification, or looking at uh, the new immigrants uh, under their temporary status where they'll fully be paying taxes uh, and saying to them, but you can't avail yourselves of the child tax credit. Those types of amendments uh, I will personally oppose, and I expect that the Gang of Eight will equally oppose them. Hmm. That's a great question. The next question is from Brian Krugel, and I think it's something that a lot of us are a bit concerned with. We keep hearing these different rumors in the House of Representatives, and he asks, isn't any type of comprehensive immigration reform coming out of the Senate bill dead on arrival? Well, look, uh, Brian, I, I believe there's absolutely no reason why the House of Representatives cannot take what I expect to be a strong vote here in the Senate for the Senate bill uh, and to take that uh, legislation or in the alternative uh, to uh, have a bipartisan group that has been working in the House to develop uh, similar legislation, not exactly the same as ours, probably less progressive than ours, but nonetheless a foundation by which we could then enter into a conference committee, which is when members, when the, both houses pass different versions of the law, uh, members of the House and the Senate on both sides of the aisle are appointed to a committee to confer and try to come out with one bill that can be sent to the president. So, you know, I see no reason why not. The House of Representatives would have to be deaf to the voices of the American people who in poll after poll say they want to see this broken immigration system fixed. Uh, and yes, they want to see border security, but they also want to see a pathway to legalization for the undocumented. And they have to be deaf to the voices of the national election that we had just mm -hmm. last November that made it very clear that this was a central issue to so many who voted in that election and said, I will support candidates for president, for the Senate, or for the House of Representatives based upon how they are dealing with the question of comprehensive immigration reform. 
And I think that we're recently also seeing Boehner really coming forward and saying that he, he really welcomes that, that debate, correct? Well, I, th I, I hope so. Mm -hmm. I hope the Speaker, that's where he's at. I mean, he has said that maybe the Senate bill can't be considered, that mm -hmm. they'll have an independent House bill. <clears throat> I want to see a, a opportunity for a vote, whether it be on our bill or for a comprehensive mm -hmm. bill. Uh, there's some suggestion about uh, piecemeal. Comprehensive reform is necessary because there are so many parts to immigration reform that piecemeal doesn't solve it. It's like Jello. If you right. stick your finger in one side, it pops out on the other side. <laughs> That's a great analogy. We can't have that. You know. <laughs> Our next question comes from Nancy Macario. How much will it cost taxpayers to enforce these new immigration laws? <clears throat> well, Nancy, that's a great question, and, and here's the answer. Uh, it won't cost taxpayers anything because uh, we purposely devised uh, in the Gang of Eight legislation that would be self-paying, which means that uh, between fines and fees, fines on those who are undocumented in the country will have to come f uh, forth and uh, go through a criminal background check, learn English, uh, pay their taxes, and pay a fine, and then also fees to adjust their status over time as well as companies that are trying to bring in, for example, you know, uh, people in the STEM field uh, to the United States because they can't find an American worker who may be an engineer or having the technical background necessary for some of these critical jobs, that they will pay fees uh, to uh, solicit uh, those visas. So the fines and all the related fees uh, will uh, self-pay. And as a matter of fact, we're waiting for a Congressional Budget Office score, but we believe that score will show this legislation to be a revenue producer. Uh, and so uh, we look forward to that score. So you're preempting my next question. We keep hearing a lot of stuff, a lot of con conflicting re uh, reactions when it comes to is this an economic drain on the country or is it an economic benefit? We're getting our next question via Twitter where handle right to food, right to food, excuse me, what is the bill's economic benefits, if any? Well, there are many. Uh, allowing millions uh, to come out of the shadows and participate in American society will strengthen our economy. Uh, not only will it not add one dime to the deficit, uh, but the Center for American Progress, mm -hmm. for example, estimates that our bill could uh, add up to $832 billion, $832 billion to the gross domestic product of the United States. Uh, they also look at the reforms in the totality of our immigration bill, and uh, that would uh, be able to, looking at the totality of the bill, uh, add $1.8 trillion to the gross domestic product. So just the legalization produces one uh, universe of growth in GDP. The totality of the bill produces an even bigger growth to GDP. And there is a large number of jobs created for all America. And I think the estimate was about 121,000 mm -hmm. jobs a year for the next 10 years, which means about 1.2 million jobs. Why? Because obviously by fully participating in the economy, f paying taxes, both federal and state, that they'll be engaged in. Also, you have the entrepreneurial spirit, the mm -hmm. Maria Teresa that you know so well of our community and immigrant communities in general that create small businesses and then hire people. And uh, they're so, younger, right? So they're at the they're, peak yeah, of their yeah, yeah, productive and, and, age. And they're, so. they're in the productive mm -hmm. age. They spend more of their disposable income. And for so good or worse, it Senator. Has, <laughs> for better or worse, but they ultimately, mm -hmm. that has a ripple effect in the economy. So we see this as a positive net. That's excellent. So, and I think also, you know, there, there's a myth that the immigrants right now aren't paying. Harvard just did a beautiful study found, finding that they pay close to 120 trillion uh, billion dollars a year when it comes to Medicare expenses, mm -hmm. as an example. So, mm -hmm. I think that the the fact that they're we're going to be able to capitalize even more on the benefits that they contribute to the economy is impressive. Absolutely. Senator, I know you're aware of the importance that the Latino community has placed in the fa on the family reunification issue. And we received quite a few questions about it. Our next question comes from Lorena, who asks, what does the proposed bill hope to accomplish in regards to keeping families together? Well, this has been one of the core principles that I have been fighting uh, for uh, in the negotiations in the Gang of Eight, in preserving it uh, in the Senate Judiciary Committee and seeking to both preserve it uh, uh, on the Senate floor. First of all, 
immediate family relatives of a green card holder, in essence a permanent resident, uh, will immediately be able to be with their spouse and minor child. Hmm. That's something that does not exist in the law today. These individuals are separated. Yeah. So this legislation brings them together. They say if you're a green card holder, you're going to be able to immediately be with your spouse and minor child. Secondly, it would dramatically speed up the process for people who are waiting under the legal immigration system who have a visa petition approved mm -hmm. uh, for an immediate uh, family relative but whose visa petition is uh, you know languishing because it takes years to finally get to that what we call priority date, the date in which your petition and was approved. And that could be up to 10 years, right? I mean, when you and say years, you're not kidding. 10 years, and depending upon some countries, up to 20 years. Hmm. So okay. it will dramatically speed that up, and it will help uh, families with parents that are undocumented but have a U.S. Uh, child be able to have greater access to our immigration system. And so all of these are very significant uh, family reunification issues. Now, and I applaud you because I know that for a lot of families this is something that's very real. Mm -hmm. We have thousands of children that are American citizens now separated from their families that are now in, in foster care. And you're directly addressing that is incredible leadership, but also mm -hmm. provide some solace to families that perhaps they can be reunified soon. Yep. The following question is a, is a follow-up in regards to family reunification. Kesley asks, what happens to separated families who have kids put in the system because they have no, no one to take them to, but, excuse me. What happens to separated families who have, had, who have had kids put in the system because they have no one to take them to their parents? Yeah. Basically what I was sharing before, right. that you have, mil you have really thousands of children that have, are U.S. citizens and unfortunately their parents have been deported or in the right. process of deportation. Well, uh, Kesley, thank you for your question. I championed a provision that gives uh, families who have been torn apart better access to our immigration system mm -hmm. and judges and DHS personnel, Department of Homeland Security personnel, who will have more uh, discretion in looking at the specific facts. You know, uh, it seems to me that courts shouldn't be terminating a uh, parental right uh, simply based mm -hmm. on their immigration status. Yeah. Uh, and so what we did in the legislation is give uh, those parents uh, of such a child a greater opportunity to be able to stay with their child and make their case. Thank you. Our nation's immigration system is not very simple. You know we have a plethora of different branches in this massive system. For example, our next question comes from Arceli Tinchila, who asks, I have a temporary protected status, TPS. Will I have to wait 13 years to become a citizen? Well, uh, Araceli, okay, so Araceli, uh, uh, the answer is if you've been in TPS, temporary protective status, for 10 years, then you will be able to apply for permanent residency right away. If you've been in TPS uh, less than 10 years, you can either uh, wait uh, for the 10 years to lapse, in which case you can go to permanent residency. So let's say you've been in TPS eight years, mm -hmm. and two years would be the difference to get to the 10 years mm -hmm. for which you could become an immediately a permanent resident. You might want a way to do that. Or you have the option of applying under the legalization system that the legislation calls for. So either way, you're going to get a, a, a benefit that presently doesn't exist for TPS uh, individuals, because unless they can uh, ultimately um, adjust their status under the existing law, they have this temporary status but without a pathway uh, to uh, citizenship. Uh, this will give you that pathway. And now a question about dreamers. And I have to say, I've been blown away by their ability to, while they're not part of the system, to really engage the system to work for they, them. They have personified, uh, you know, the essence of citizen participation. Democracy at its best, Absolutely. I say. So the DREAMers have been fully engaged throughout this entire process, and we are now leading the, the advocacy efforts to pass immigration reform. Maria wants to know, how will DREAMers be affected by comprehensive immigration reform, and will they gain permanent residency at a faster rate? Yes. Uh, this is the best, Maria, this is the best DREAMer provisions we have seen. Uh, DREAMers would be eligible to become permanent, I mean, uh, would be eligible uh, for permanent residency after five years. Uh, and that's, that's great. Uh, and then after that immediate uh, opportunity to become uh, a United States citizen. So this is a tremendous opportunity uh, to uh, take the young men and women in this country 
who, you know, through no fault of their own, their parents brought them to this country. The only flag they've ever pledged allegiance to is that of the United States. The only national anthem they know is the Star Spangled Banner. So to be able to use their intellect and, and contributions to our country and to finally uh, give them the opportunity to realize their dreams. The best dream of provisions we've had is in this legislation. That's exciting. And now a little bit of a follow-up regarding DACA itself mm -hmm. comes from Raquel from o Oklahoma City. Will the people who have already been approved with a working permit from the uh, from direct the deferred action DACA program be automatically legalized, or are they going to have to wait wait in line as well? Well, Raquel, first of all, I hope that you've gotten through with your family through the difficult times in Oklahoma uh, with reference to the tornadoes that have, have moved through, and our thoughts and prayers are with uh, everyone in Oklahoma City. Uh, so, and also, let me use your question and say I'm so disappointed that the House of Representatives voted to defund DACA, uh, the Deferred Action Program that President Obama put in at the petition of so many of us, uh, 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 you know, last year. Uh, but that's not going anywhere in the Senate, I can assure you of that. So DACA will continue to move forward. And the specific answer to your question is, yes, if you're in DACA and the Deferred Action Program, your petition will be expedited compared to someone who is not. And now a question from Kyle Bracken, basically shifting, shifting gears a little bit and something that the president really drove home. The following question is regarding border security. There seems to be a lot of crime coming up from our southern borders. Will immigration reform make this better? I'm assuming he's being stopping that, <laughs> stopping right, the crime right, from our borders. Right, right, right. Well, uh, Kyle, I hear your concerns, and the reality is, is that, uh, first of all, we have more border enforcement than at any other time in the nation's history. We have more border patrol, more customs inspections, more physical impediments, aerial surveillance, uh, and border crossings are dramatically down. Having said that, we also spend in this legislation uh, anywhere between three and six billion dollars depending upon how the uh, process moves forward in terms of what's working to make sure that we maximize our border enforcement and these provisions were largely written by our colleagues in the Gang of Eight who come from border states. Mm. So they know very, very much so uh, what some of these challenges are. And we listen to what their views are mm -hmm. in terms of uh, making uh, this a reality. Uh, so, you know, I think that uh, when you ask that question, the reality is, is that, yes, uh, we will have even greater border uh, enforcement than we already do. As a matter of fact, if you add up all of the monies already being spent on border enforcement and what this legislation calls for and not only the money but the detail of how those border enforcement provisions take place we will spend more money on border enforcement than we spend in all of the law and federal law enforcement agencies together and this is layered on top of the our borders never been more secure correct yeah. as i so, said border right. crossings are mm -hmm. down and our borders never been more secure mm -hmm. we've got more uh, all of the different elements of border security have been dramatically beefed up, but we hear the concerns and we work with our colleagues who come from border states to ultimately make it even more secure. And, uh, but what we cannot have, let me just use your question today, what we cannot have is those who would use the issue of border security uh, to ultimately create an amendment that is a poison pill mm -hmm. because the way they define border security it would never be possible to achieve 100 percent of uh, of entire uh, you know never find having one person who might cross and therefore say the pathway to citizenship uh, is not possible that we cannot accept uh, because there isn't anything that right. the government does that is a hundred percent perfect well, so, anybody, uh, not just the government. Yeah, right? <laughs> absolutely. But since we're talking about the government, yeah, 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 but, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. I think that that's uh, that's a falsehood that that mm -hmm. some are offering mm -hmm. under the guise of border security. But if you're going to spend six and a half billion dollars more, mm -hmm. if you detailed via uh, the individuals who come from the border states and have talked to. Uh, many of the people engage in border enforcement each and every day and have listened to their ideas and incorporated it uh, or will incorporate it by amendment, as Senator McCain, for example, has suggested right. that uh, something that we can be supportive of, then uh, I think you've done as much as you humanly can, and you're going to have the securest border in the history of the nation. Right. 
This que the next question comes from Deanna Moreno. Deanna asks, while waiting in the U.S. for status adjustment, can an immigration immigrant travel abroad to their home country and return to the U.S.? And I know that's for a lot of folks when they're in the middle of processing their papers, they haven't been able to leave the United States. Right. Well, the, end of the simple answer to that is yes. And a registered provisional immigrant, which is what we would call the person who, who is undocumented and after the law gets signed, comes forth, registers with the government, goes to that criminal background check, assuming they pass that, they would be eligible to travel abroad for up to 180 days. And I think for a lot of families that have been separated because they, their loved ones haven't sure. been able to travel, this is incredibly sure. it's important. A, it's a big thing in which, uh, obviously, individuals who are undocumented in the country uh, fear leaving mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately have not been able to see a loved one who's been infirmed, uh, haven't been able to see family members, in some cases for years. Uh, this will recognize an opportunity for that humane aspect of having families be able to see each other, have access uh, to do so, and to do so for, you know, about six months. So it sounds like, Deanna, you may be able to go to Christmas, for, go home for Christmas. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Senator, next we have a very important question from Christian Schmidt. What can the average person do to help pass some comprehensive immigration reform? Sounds easy, but can you provide specific examples of things that can make a difference from our house, from America? Well, uh, it's a great question. Let's see, it's Christian. Uh, it's a great question, uh, Christian, and, and one that we need to be focused on. As a matter of fact, before we started uh, the, the program, Maria Teresa and I were talking about what do we need to do. Well, what we need to do is to keep the citizen involvement in this issue uh, focused, uh, even during the Senate debate as it, be as it continues to move forward, to express what you're for, which I hope will be for comprehensive immigration reform, that includes a pathway to citizenship, uh, that preserves family reunification, and doesn't uh, get so punitive towards the individuals who are undocumented in the country, as some would like to see. And uh, to do that by calling up your members of Congress, even though the bill is not there yet, but they're considering their own process. This bill will hopefully be moving over there. And uh, so s making sure that uh, they know how you feel, calling up your two United States senators, wherever you may be living, uh, creating a impact on the public opinion makers, which to me means uh, guest editorials, letters to the editor, uh, talk radio, uh, online media, web chats. I mean, I would just continue mm -hmm. to promote the reasons why this is good for the national security of the United States, good for the national economy of the United States, preserves the very essence of uh, our nation as a nation of immigrants. And if we collectively do that throughout this whole Senate process, moving into the House process, we will find ourselves on that day in which we will see at the Oval Office the President signing legislation that can finally bring millions of people out of the shadows into the light, reform our system, further secure our country, grow our economy, and preserve that great history of this nation. And Senator, when you announced with the Gang of Eight the bill, I was there in the audience, and one of the things that you so eloquently made a case for of why we need to provide a pathway to citizenship for these 11 million. And I think oftentimes that's the debate right now. Sure, let's provide them residency, but not necessarily a pathway to citizenship. Why is that so important? Not, for, not It may not be for them, but so much more for our American, our American economy, but also our American DNA. Well, you know, uh, I think uh, Europe is a great example of the challenges mm -hmm. of uh, many countries that do not provide immigrants with a pathway to earn being a citizen of that country. It creates a second-class citizen. It creates unrest. You know, it, the reality is, is that uh, if you had, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables, uh, either for breakfast or dinner last night, it was probably picked uh, by the bent back of an immigrant worker mm -hmm. uh, under a hot sun. If you had chicken, uh, you know, for lunch today, it probably was deplucked by the cut-up hands of an immigrant worker. If you slept in a hotel or motel room of the nation, it was probably prepared by the hands of an immigrant worker. If you have a loved one who is infirmed, 
they're probably being tended to in their daily needs to the steady hand and warm heart of an immigrant worker. If you're at one of those startup uh, companies, uh, and, you know, that is blossoming uh, in the high-tech field, it probably was started, as, uh, as we've noted uh, on our floor speeches, about 25% of all those startups are started by an immigrant to this country. Mm -hmm. So this is about growing our economy and making sure that there are no second-class citizens and making sure that you don't have an underclass that is exploited hmm. and by being exploited creates downward pressures on all American workers jobs. So uh, I think this is very important to have the pathway to citizenship to integrate people uh, into our society and to fully participate uh, in the American uh, process. And thank you for that. I think that you've made the case beautifully, and you're right. We've already lived that history of second-class citizen, right? Mm -hmm. Our, we're supposed to be moving forward as a, as a country, so I think you stated it beautifully. And finally, we wouldn't be voto latino si no tenemos una pregunta en español. Okay. <laughs> Por ejemplo, Andrea Silva le pregunta, senador, hemos visto cómo los republicanos han bloqueado el DREAM Act y las negociaciones para una reforma en el 2007. ¿Por qué cree usted que van a aprobar la reforma esta vez? Eh, bueno, Andrea, eh, yo creo que la razón que vamos a lograr una eh, legalización eh, y una reforma migratoria integral eh, es porque nosotros como una comunidad alzamos nuestras voces en la última elección eh, nacional para la presidencia, para el Congreso, y hablamos bien claro de que queremos ver representantes en el Congreso que van a promover una reforma migratoria integral, que van a preservar la reunificación familiar como un valor de ese sistema migratorio y de nuestra comunidad, que entienden las contribuciones de inmigrantes, pero que esas contribuciones pudieran ser mucho más grandes si actualmente pudieran salir de la oscuridad a la luz. Eh, y en fin, eh, porque esas voces y, y el, el cambio que hemos visto en nuestro país manda un mensaje a esos que están en el Congreso. Y yo espero de que el trabajo que hemos hecho con cuatro colegas republicanos es un índice de que ellos entienden, el Partido Republicano, que se opuso en su gran mayoría la última vez, eh, que hay que cambiar y hay que tener una reforma. Y esa es eh, la razón por la cual yo estoy optimista. Thank you, Senator. And as you can see, there's incredible interest in, in this town hall. Keeping in that spirit, because time is, time is running short, what advice can you share with our audience for moving the needle forward on this issue? Yeah. What can they do to keep the democratic process alive? Well, uh, as I said uh, in Spanish, for those who don't understand Spanish, because it's basically <laughs> the question that one of our uh, uh, participants asked, look, we need to do everything we can. Uh, during the Senate debate, moving into the House, uh, and throughout this whole process to keep the citizen participation uh, engaged. That means calling your United States senators from your state. It means calling your representatives uh, from the House of Representatives. It means voicing your opinions in the opinion-making process, our newspapers, web chats, uh, you know, mm -hmm. talk radio, uh, online. Uh, and if we do that, we'll finally see the comprehensive immigration reform that we all hope for. So you're saying flood the airwaves and making sure that we're driving them a little bit local so that they, know, they listen to, the, to us. <laughs> flood the airwaves and flood the phones. So let me uh, thank everyone who participated today. Our time has, has come to an end. I'm sorry I didn't get to the opportunity to answer every question, and I don't want to end this important conversation here, so I'm going to try and answer as many more questions as I can right on my fi uh, Twitter feed. I want to end uh, with this point. We still have a lot of work to do. As we just said, the continued advocacy and pressure from immigration reform supporters is instrumental to our success, and I firmly support and encourage your efforts to promote passage of this long overdue legislation that will fix a broken system once and for all, bringing millions out of the shadows, a clear pathway to earn citizenship. I want to ask all of you to contact your state's U.S. Senators, Congressmen, to remind them that you stand for comprehensive immigration reform and that you will judge their political future based on how they vote. I'm confident that if the community continues to mobilize, we will address our nation's broken immigration system in a humane and fair manner that will only strengthen our nation, a nation of immigrants. And Maria Teresa, to you and to the folks at Voto Latino, uh, thank you again for all that you've no, done in you. this process and continue to do to ensure our shared dream becomes a reality.
Thank you, Senator, for your time. More importantly, for the work that you've been doing behind the scenes. I, I used to work in Congress. I know that what you're doing is not easy, but you're showing incredible leadership. And I think there's a lot of young people out there that want to emulate you and will run someday. So thank you for your time. Thank you for the folks on Twitter. We're eager to pass this bill. For the past few months, Voto Latino's audience has been following the development of this proposal closely. And they're committed to doing whatever it takes to pass it. They've called their members of Congress, written letters to their local editors, and spread awareness on social media. Rest assured, people watching will heed your advice that a lot of work remains to be done. It's simple. Congress will not act unless all of us call our senators and congressmen to demand they support common sense immigration reform. Thanks to all of you for tuning in, and remember to contact your members of Congress by dialing, flood the lines, 1-888-659-0306. Again, dial 1-888-659-0306. Follow Voto Latino on Twitter, myself, and I want to thank Elaine Ramos for taking over our Twitter account. Please follow her at ER Geek, Geek Goddess and keep us moving. I encourage you to continue the conversation with Senator Menendez on Twitter. And again, everyone, thank you for your time. But remember, the work has just started. Thank you. Great.